come together to declare a climate emergency. Um, we declared in 2019, and since then we have over 5,000 people from the music industry who have signed the declaration, including all the major record companies, leading independent labels, some big music in institutions, tons and tons of uh, artists, including some very big names like Billie Eilish and um, the 1975 Foles, um, with too many to mention Shabaka Hutchins, so some great artists, but uh, you can check out our website at www.musicdeclares.net to see the full list of um, uh, declarers and also for some great actions that you can take to make your own practice as musicians and artists and individuals working in the industry more sustainable. So this panel is happening as part of our Turn Up the Volume week of Climate Action, which is um, asking the music industry to use its voice to call for urgent action on the climate emergency and to take action itself. So we've had some really um, brilliant stuff happening. Um, lots of music industry organisations committing to making systemic change in their own organisations to reduce their carbon emissions and lots of artists getting on board to use their voice to call for action on, on climate. We have reached recently um, very uh, gladly started the Classical Declares wing, which has just taken off with a huge flourish. Um, we have a, it has its own team working specifically on the classical department and is being headed up by Ellie Wyatt and Sarah Nichols, who is our host today. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining and enjoy the uh, panel. Great. Thanks, Maddie. Um, so hello to everyone. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. As Maddie was saying, this is very much the start of like classical declares. Um, so it's really great to be here. I'm really thrilled that the panelists have all taken time out to join us and really interested to have this conversation. Um, obviously, it's an enormous topic, classical music in a cl climate crisis. Um, so we're not uh, expecting to get to the end of the discussion, but really it's just a to start it, um, I feel very strongly that conversation is uh, the positive starting place for change and sharing um, together is like how we might solve things or begin to solve things. So, sorry, um, sorry to interrupt you one moment, Sarah, just uh, just a briefly a little bit of housekeeping, which I just forgot to do. OK, uh, please. Could you make sure that all, you, all of you are on mute? And if you have any questions, can you place them in the chat and I will I will forward them on to Sarah. Um, and can you use the chat spare, sparingly because um, it can be quite distracting for the pa panelists and for the participants if everyone's chatting away. So um, if you could please use the chat to place your questions and any relevant links, but um, apart from that, keep it quite quiet. Thank you very much. Sorry, Sarah. That's absolutely fine. So um, let's get on with introductions. I'm gonna let everybody introduce themselves and um, inspired by The Guilty Feminist, I thought it would be quite nice if we all started um, with a sort of statement about who we are, like, please give your name and, you know, job, whatever in information you want to give about what you do. Um, but then also uh, a sort of, I've, I'd really like to join the fight to stop climate change. But um, so for me, it's, it's probably this beast behind me, which is my piano. So I'm Sarah Nichols, I'm a pianist and a composer, but I have a really massive, heavy piano that I have to take in diesel vans everywhere which is a disaster so um that's that's me um and let's do the thing where you just pass to somebody else because it's very hard to gesture on zoom because everyone screens differently so i'm going to pass to the person next to me which is camilla hi everybody um i'm camilla king i'm head of programming at Shotland music festival and um i want to be good at climate change but um sometimes audience expectations get in the way of that and is something that I'm wrestling with a little bit at the moment. And can you and pass to someone? I will. I will pass to Sharice. Hello, everybody. I'm Sharice Beaumont, co-founder of Black Lives in Music. And I really want to be a lot better in concerns to clim the climate crisis and climate change. Um, I can't think of anything musical apart from touring the country, which is, actually hasn't happened for a year. So I can only think about what's happening in my home, which is I use far too much water. So um, that is somewhere I need, definitely a place where I need some improvement. Um, I'm going to pass on to Leonikos. 
Um, yeah, thanks, Rhys. So I'm uh, Laonicus uh, from Sound and Music, or Lao for short. Um, I would love to help some climate change, but I am from Greece and my family is in Greece. So I'm conflicted about trying to persuade all of my friends to fly less, but having to balance that with the need to see my family on a, at least like once yearly. So I'm sort of, that, that is a conflict I have to, I haven't figured out yet. Um, obviously we haven't flown for a year thanks to the pandemic. Um, so it's been easy for the last 12 months, but um, once we're able to be different, and I'll hand over to Gabriel. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Gabriel Prokofiev. I'm a composer and artistic director of Non-Classical. And yeah, I'm, I'm trying to do what the best I can you know, to help. Well, not the best I can, I don't know. We're, it's a journey, but trying to do what I can to help with climate change. And uh, on, uh, to do with Non-Classical, which is a record label, we're in this tough situation whereby streaming is becoming one of the main ways of getting our music out. And actually streaming is a hidden big culprit in uh, carbon emissions. And in fact, I've seen some evidence that says carbon emissions from streaming is actually higher than it was from making vinyl and CDs back in the nineties and two thousands. So everyone thinks, oh, I'm being green. There's no product, it's just streaming. But actually this is a really serious problem and we've got to, really think of strategies of how we can deal with this, how we can share music, sell music without causing uh, climate issues. And I'm going to pass on to Sarah G. Thank you. I'm Sarah G. I'm Chief Executive of Spitalfields Music and I want to help with climate change, but post-it notes, <laughs> they are absolutely my crack. I just cannot live without them. Uh, and I feel really bad, um, but uh, yeah, they are my to-do list, my, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. And I'm gonna pass over to Laura. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, hi, I'm Laura Bowler and I'm a composer and vocalist. I'm currently working with London Symphonietta on a large scale project centered around climate change. Um, and I really want to help stop climate change, but unfortunately, some of my work, which uh, it's very difficult to turn down as a freelancer, requires me to fly long haul. So I frequently find myself flying to Canada, uh, particularly, which uh, is problematic. So that's my, my grapple at the moment. Thank you. Thank you all. That was great. Um, thanks for being game and sharing your your vulnerabilities. Um, it does feel like really important to me to to be able to do this. Like I remember Caroline Lucas years and years ago sort of saying, look, yeah, occasionally I might get in a car, you know, please don't chastise me for that. You know, actually, this the, the entire situation is never going to be solved if everyone who's joining in the solution is like has to be perfect before they start. So anyway, um, so it seems to me there's some things that really draw us together, like travel is a is a first one that pops out. Um, and um, just yeah, like I'm thinking about, for example, Cheltenham Festival and Spitalfields music, you know, when you're kind of booking international artists and that sort of thinking, um obviously laura's talked about traveling everyone's got this so i mean should we just kick that about for a couple of minutes um does anybody want to jump in with thoughts or you know challenges yeah go i mean well i i had an interesting experience recently i went um just over a year ago i was invited to a, a, a the verbier art summit and it was the theme was about um climate crisis and verbier it's right you know it's down in switzerland and um, I realized I could actually take the train. And it was a much, it was a long journey. I think it was something like eight hours train in total. You know, it's Eurostar changing in Paris, then going down, changing Lausanne. But actually, if you'd flown, it might have still been, because it's up in the mountains, it still might have ended up being six or seven hours. And obviously, you know, there's so much in favor of that. And I sort of, it made me think, actually, there, there are, okay, international long haul, it's, you're stuck there in a way that's a different question but I think for the whole of Europe now it is possible to do it by train and it's just to do with timetabling and you can work for the whole train journey you know have your laptop you can do emails you can catch up and all kinds of things and I think also for booking international artists if you focus on those based in in Europe you can still be international just stick to trains so I think there's no excuse actually not to do that you know and it's just planning it comes down to so um 
Camilla and Sarah, do you find you have this conversation with people that you want to invite to your festivals? I mean, from my perspective, um, inviting international artists from outside Europe um, tends to be financially tricky anyway, <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless they're already coming over as part of a series of concerts in the UK, which already helps solve that problem a little bit. And I think that's something really important for us to consider because for me, from a, an artistic perspective, I think it would be really, it would be such a shame if we weren't bringing outside voices in because there's a lot to be learned from that. Um, and it's wonderful for our audiences to hear other, other musicians. And it's really important for the cultural life of this country, as we've seen with Brexit and all those issues that musicians are facing now with traveling to Europe and so on. It, you know, th this is a really important thing for our sector, but being intentional about when you book those artists and how, and making sure that it fits within a single trip that encompasses other events um, and it isn't just kind of flying back for one thing and out again helps to offset that so I think that that for me is something that I always try and do yeah and, and very very similar at Spitalfields I mean as it happens we we haven't actually done a festival in real life since uh, December 2018 because uh, we took 19 as a as a fallow year and then 2020 of course as we all know was a year that didn't happen um, this year, there are some projects that we've we've had to change because of COVID, um, and some of that would have included international travel, but it would have been by train, and it's certainly something that that we want to <clears throat> excuse me that we want to write into future contracts. You know, I've, I was really inspired by the work that um, that Fiona Robertson has done up in in Sound Festival in in Aberdeenshire, where she writes that in. You know, that's that's absolutely you know. Uh, a given and and uh, um, I know that this this project that that Laura's working on that that is really interesting in that regard there's just one other thing I wanted to say on this sort of international touring because I've worked in orchestras for for many many years and you know I look back and kind of think of the churn of composers and soloists that we had and conductors you know every week flying in from all over the world you know pinging off to somewhere else and actually makes me feel a bit queasy now. And I had the same thought when the, uh, the Super League was being announced this week. You know, the idea of uh, midweek football matches just being slotted into schedules. I mean, there was no way that they were doing that in any way other than private jet. But there was nobody kind of saying, aside from all the other things, the environmental impact of this proposed new Super League is just nuts. Why are they even countenancing that? So it's, it's the really same for our sector. That's really interesting about the contracts. Um, Laura? Um, yeah, I was just going to mention the fact with uh, with Europe, obviously one can travel to most places by train, although there are areas of kind of Scandinavia that make it much trickier. Um, but <laughs> having looked before and seeing that it's going to take me 28 hours to get to somewhere in North Sweden. Um, <laughs> but actually the thing for me is not necessarily always about the time because like Gabriel stated, you can work on the train and things like that. It's actually the added cost uh, which, of course, uh, you know, for festivals is a big thing, but also as a freelancer, like I remember recently when I was traveling to Sweden, it was the difference between £120 to fly or actually nearly £1,000 for me to get there via train, uh, which is just totally prohibitive. So I think that's something where actually we need kind of a structural institutional change in terms of the cost of more carbon neutral travel. Totally agree with that. I think we'd all get behind much costlier flying and much cheaper trains. Who votes for that? Hands up. <laughs> uh, so um, let's move on to other challenges and, and solutions. And Sharice and Lau, maybe you'd like to come in. Um, are there things that, that, you know, you sort of come back to as, as issues that are sort of like, ah, oh, this is this is bothering me. I don't know how to find a, a, a kind of way around this, you know, p particular challenges. Um, or anybody else with? I mean, to be honest, uh, I won't say much because of the way our organisation is structured. It's more advocacy and using our voices. And I just, I think this new um, panel that we have here will do the world in regards to amplifying the need of um, the climate climate crisis that we're in. I think... Um, I'm I'm really interested actually. I, I, I like technology and AI 
And I was really trying to gear myself up to find out how, what, what, what's happening, how can we utilize technology and AI in regards to the climate crisis? And I know there are some things happening, but um, Gabriel touched on something in regards to streaming. And I'd really like to hear a little bit more about that if possible. Yeah, I'm, I can go for it. Yeah. A bit more. I mean, I've always, it's something I just thought about years ago about the whole thing of the, the cloud, that if you have something in Dropbox, their, their service means that it's always accessible. So it basically means somewhere there's a hard drive with your files that's just on all the time. Whereas if you put it on your own hard drive, you can just turn it off. You only turn it on when you need it. But because I've got, you know, gigabyte on a cloud, basically I'm just causing the hard drive to be on all the time. And then if you think of streaming, it's like every song needs to be accessible all the time. And then lots of people want to play them. So you've got kind of, I don't know how it works, whether they have multiple copies or how this sort of thing is all streamed out. But it's just, it's, you know, it's a massive amount of energy and um, it's, it's okay it's it, apparently it's equivalent to the to the aviation in the end it's like the amount it's grown it's it's not as, as huge as some of the others but everything adds up that's the thing you know when you can't when you say oh this is just a few percent it's not such a big deal we have to just look at everything and it is a really significant factor and obviously that's that's streaming music that's also netflix youtube i think that's 60 percent they're a higher they're taking a higher amount um, I've got it. I found a little diagram about it actually um, that I can share on the chat. But annoyingly, it doesn't show. It shows how much carbon was being generated by um, MP3s, which is massive. But they don't have the facts about streaming yet. It's something that's still sort of being researched, unfortunately. And so we don't have the exact. But the, the, the challenge is, is, you know, we thought that streaming was good because there's no physical product. Mm. And now it turns out that actually it's environmentally less damaging to have to have vinyl or CDs because that's a permanent. You're not throwing it away. You're keeping it vinyl. You can now get recycled vinyl. Um, but then there's the shipping costs for vinyl that does need to be factored in. So it, it's it's sort of a dilemma. You think, well, how the hell are we going to. How do we share our music now? I, I was thinking maybe downloading and just at least keeping it on a hard drive so you just play it mm. when you need it. Or, you know, it's on your computer, which is probably on anyway. So you're using it. At least you're not then having to use it from the cloud as well. So it's kind of reducing cloud usage could be something. But and, and maybe musicians would get paid more, do you think? They would. I mean, that's the <laughs> other thing. That would be, that's the little secret thing. So I feel like we should be encouraging people to go back to downloading and 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 physical, um, you know, radio in a way. I mean, streaming is now taken over from radio because we want to just play whatever we want to hear at any given moment. But the radio obviously is just airwaves. There's no, there's, you know, it's just one hard drive going out to millions of people. So... Mm. It feels like actually that's the whole topic that we need to really research and really, because I, I'm not quite sure what the solution is at the moment. And so, um, yeah, so. it's Well, it's, it just sounds like we should have a whole panel about that because actually it's a yeah. massive thing, isn't it? How, how yeah. our music is distributed because, you know, oftentimes it feels like you're completely at the behest of, you know, major streaming companies to get heard at all. So, and also the Broken Record campaign has had a, a good um, lift yesterday with a le another letter that's gone. Um, so, yeah, let's hope that streaming also becomes fairer. Um, Camilla, you yeah. put your hand up and... Uh, uh yeah, I was just going to say it's something that I've talked about with um, with colleagues at work, just the whole question of data. And it's not <laughs> this isn't specific to classical music, but I think it is going to become something incredibly important as we as we go on across across the world. Because if you've ever seen um, on telly or pictures of those data farms that they have in the US where a lot of our data is stored, I know for Jutland festivals, that's where all our data is kind of stored on this huge farm and they're the they're enormous I mean you can't even imagine the size of these places and it's just full of electrical electrical equipment that's just on 24 7 and that the output and the impact on the environment of that is a is a massive thing and, and we think oh well we you know we're not storing things physically anymore so that's better we can't see it but actually it, it's a massive issue that I think individuals and organizations are going to have to 
you're gonna have to address at some point um really soon it's you know go loud yeah, I, th I think it's a, it's a really, really interesting point. And particularly with the whole non-fungible tokens, NFTs coming into play as well, there's, there's been a lot of sort of pushback and, and, you know, are they environmentally sustainable? Is the impact of those NFT trans transactions too big? And, and are new technologies going to solve that? Um, and, and I think it, it is an interesting one. And that comes down to energy as well, which, you know, some energy that we consume in our venues and our offices we can choose to go to green supplier to supply ourselves and so on but how often do we think about the energy consumed by all of the stuff that we use about you know, zoom servers and skype servers and and dropbox and google drive and all the web hosting services and do we have any impact can we change them to green you know, are the hosters um, host suppliers who use green energy could we switch to them um because i, I imagine only a a percentage of that energy actually is sustainable globally because a lot of the servers will be in places like America and, and probably using the cheapest kind of energy to be affordable and competitive. Mm. Um, and, and that, again, brings me back to um, an interesting discussion I sort of um, tagged along on Twitter with um, a woman called Rosalind Redhead, I think, or Reedhead, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name. She was running for mayor with the Greens, I think, a couple of years ago. And she was saying, it's not about where you know working from home there's a huge increase in zoom meetings which has a, a, a sort of environmental impact in that sense and people were saying oh is the pace that better than people commuting and she said well it's not about is that better or not it's about is it sustainable or not because it might be better but if it's still not sustainable we've got to think of other ways of addressing that and i think that's an interesting one of we've got all these things at our fingertips and hmm. are they better yes or no but also are they sustainable in the long term yes or no and that's the key question because we can keep making things better but until we make them really sustainable we're still gonna contribute to the climate crisis and not really avert it to the extent that we should yeah that's a good phrase to hold on to um so uh, like there's loads of other things that i thought we might have time to talk about like um you know we were chatting about printed programs for example i was chatting to camilla about that at cheltenham festival um i'm thinking about like I don't know, air conditioning in concert halls or like, you know, things that are really specific to our industry. Are there any quick ones that anyone wants to throw in before we go on to kind of more creative uh, discussion? I, yeah, go for it. it. I mean, it's something that, that we're dealing with at Cheltenham Festivals at the moment. We we are um, signed up to Vision 2025, which is a festival-wide pledge um, of sustainability. And so we're working um, to kind of carbon targets for 2025 and um, one of the areas that we've identified as, as somewhere that we can have a huge impact is with our printing because um, it's not just the music festival at Cheltenham festivals we've got three other festivals as well and with all the brochures that we print every single year you know we're talking tens of thousands um, of bits of paper and, and I love print um, I love the love getting hold of my brochure and my program book and <laughs> having it in my hands when it's been all beautifully designed and printed out but um, it's a problem and so we've covid has kind of and i think this is a good thing but it also has a negative side we've we've kind of leapt forward in terms of some of our sustainability goals this year because we've um we're going completely digital with all our print so we're not going to have any brochures we're not having program books or or what we call a festival guide which is a single book for the whole festival that's been a really important piece of memorabilia for a lot of our really keen supporters we're not going to have that that was initially decided partly because of sustainability, but also because of COVID and wanting to avoid having print and bits of paper lying around the place and all that kind of thing. Um, but obviously that isn't something that um, we were able to have a big long consultation period about or discussion with our audiences. It's something that COVID kind of forced us into making happen right away. And, um, and so that's great because the decision has been made and it's happened. But the flip side of that is that for audiences, that's a really massive change in how they've kind of consumed the festival and interacted with us, if you like. And not having that piece of memorabilia to carry around with them at the festival and take away is is a really big deal and something that that some people feel, you know, like we've got people who've been coming to the festival for 40 plus years and have every single program from those times. And you can imagine, you know, I, I and I share that kind of, sorrow a bit with them not to have it so wrestling with those expectations of, of people coming to your events and interacting with your organization and that sudden change is 
it's difficult. Um, Maybe. I mean, it's all about communication, but and it, it is a change that has to happen. I think it is something that we have to embrace. This is a crisis. You know, we it's a climate crisis. We can't. Some things we just have to do and say this really, really matters. We've got to make this change. But taking people along with you is a challenge for sure. Mm. I can I can really imagine that person with the program book having sat in festivals you know and actually because festivals are enormous if you don't like the piece you can be reading about you know the concert tomorrow when (laughs) yeah it's quite useful I find yeah and you see people walking around our sites with their brochures with post-it notes on all the events they're going to and it's really yeah you know it's it's a really big part of the experience I mean maybe you could maybe you could charge loads more for a limited edition one do you think that you (laughs) We'll keep on their shelves forever yeah. maybe maybe <laughs> i mean I, there was a i'm searching on my phone for the name of the site so i'll find it but um I'm, I'm not sure if everybody knows of this company but there's a green a sustainable um a paper company i mean is it worth just making sure that you use one of those companies and maybe i'm a, you know i'm a bit behind but i would have thought that would have been a obviously quality i don't know there might be your usual printers but it you know, to make a, you know, a decision, I'm going to go with this company that goes yeah. green. And I say something that we're doing a lot of is, <clears throat> is researching to make sure that we're using local companies wherever we can, that we are working with sustainable partners. We're working with our recycling company at the moment to make sure that everywhere our waste goes is green and sustainable and all those things. But we're, it's, it's a bit like with the streaming, like if you do the printing, just the process of printing creates a lot of carbon and if it goes to people's homes and then eventually they bin it or they don't even open the package with the brochure in Mm -hmm. that in itself is a waste so it but it is it's these checks and balances with everything that that we have to weigh up from from post-it notes to orchestras on on coaches like we're talking such massive extremes aren't we of of every single level of of what you do has to be thought about just to add about the, the printing i guess it's about factoring in the environmental cost and so these things of programs that used to just be run off and often yeah imported from china because that's the they're doing the cheapest printing there or, or who knows where and um that if you in factor in the environmental costs yeah they're going to become luxury items really and we have to just view them as that and just change our attitude completely really because even if we use yeah you can use the green companies but they they still will have it still has an impact you know they're still they've still got energy usage and the ink there's no real green inks out there and there's still the recycling so i think yeah obviously it's it's about factoring in the, the actual environmental costs so so everything cha- our attitudes sort of change to how we deal with paper and these souvenirs now i just, I just I remember a sort of anecdote um off of what gabriel was saying um around treating sort of brochures as, as a luxury item, which I think is a really good way of thinking about it. I remember listening to a, um, a lecture by um, philosopher Alan Watts, and he said, he sort of talked about Buddhism and, and Western societies and stuff. And he said that often Western societies are branded as materialistic, but he said, actually, we're anti-materialistic because we don't value materials. We churn them, we throw them away, and we waste so much material that we're not materialistic. If we were materialistic, we would love and cherish materials. And actually value them for what they are and I think maybe that's part of that shift in culture that we need to have to start really valuing materials and part of that is maybe with an understanding of the environmental value they have and the cost that they have to which at the moment is not part of the equation is it yeah. we we throw stuff away and the, the costs the pollution costs the extraction costs the carbon emissions costs none of that is factored into the price that we pay at the shop so um so that's an interesting one how, how do we sort of shift and start really and incorporating all of that cost into, into the, the value of items and products to really appreciate them differently. So um, I want to jump now into um, hearing a bit more from Laura, if we could, um, who's been writing a piece for London Sinfonietta. Um, can you just tell us about it and sort of tell us what you're trying to do through it? Yeah, of course. So um, the piece is called Houses Slide and it has a libretto that's made up from verbatim text from a call out that we did through London Sinfonietta for people's responses to three questions uh, and also original text by Cordelia Lynn and it's directed by Katie Mitchell and uh, the idea of the piece takes us through various stages of kind of climate psychology Uh, so the first section kind of is that epiphany moment of the realization of some people go through when they realize that climate change is a thing and they acknowledge it's 
the existence of it, so to speak. Uh, and the second stage is uh, centered around kind of that immersion mode where we kind of flood ourselves with all of the information. We read all the papers, we look in the articles, we go to the websites, we follow every single video that we can find about it on YouTube and that kind of deep dive into the subject matter and the problem. Uh, and then the third stage of the work looks at the depression stage of that, actually climate grief and the realization of how actually colossal and overwhelming um, this, uh, the, the, the climate change issue is. Uh, and then the final stage of the work is kind of a resolution where it looks to that kind of looking forward and the positive action that we can take and all of the pieces interspersed with the thoughts and feelings and actions of the people that have submitted uh, to, the, to the call. But actually one of the most exciting things about the project is that we're trying to bike power the whole piece. <laughs> Uh, so uh, the pieces that amplified uh, 12 piece ensemble and soloist are Sprano, Jessica, Zodi. Um, and Jessica herself will be cycling all the way through the piece while singing. <laughs> and uh, so she will be powering her own lighting and her own microphone. Um, and we're obviously trying to bike power the whole ensemble. So we're going through the process at the moment with uh, Colin Tonks, who uh, owns Electric Pedals, the company. Um, and we're going through the process of kind of figuring out exactly how many cyclists we need to, to power everything in the piece, because the piece also uses live electronics um, and a fixed media part as well. So there's lots of different elements that we've got to power, <laughs> which is obviously a little bit tricky. But we figured that, you know, instead of kind of trying to uh, sacrifice what the artistic intentions of the piece were, we try and match it with as, as much as uh, we could in terms of the technology of using bike power uh, for the piece and trying to take it off grid. Um, so that's kind of like uh, the overall background, I suppose, to the work and where we're at at the moment with it. <laughs> I love the image of the, is she a soprano? Uh, she is, and it's part of it as well, I think. Like for me, that struggle that we all go through mentally right. of, of kind of the, the hypocrisy that we feel uh, in all the things that we do that we know are bad for the environment. And that really is going to be embodied in her performance physically because we will literally see her uh, struggling. And I'm very grateful that she's agree <laughs> agreed to do this. Yeah, well, um, yeah it, feels, it feels like how, how many of us are feeling constantly, I feel like we're sort of, you know, trying to pedal somewhere in the right way and realising there's, yeah. there's such complexity. That's the thing, isn't it? From when you want to buy a piece of food in a shop, you know, to where it's come from, how it's packaged, you know, it's like, so yeah, many layers of complexity. Um, we, I, I haven't really been keeping an eye on the chat and I, but I am keeping an eye on the time. And um, I really want to bring us on to kind of, um, sorry, Laurie, you were just going to say. I was just going to add this actually one thing because it re related to something that someone put in the chat um, about the carbon footprint of making the piece. We're actually trying to uh, monitor our carbon footprint through the whole process. So like even our Zoom discussions, when someone goes to a meeting in person, like how they travel. So we're basically clocking up the carbon footprint of the piece as accurately as we can. And so uh, despite our efforts, I'm sure we'll find out at the end that um, maybe the carbon footprint is a lot larger than we'd hoped, but we feel like we need to make ourselves accountable if we're making a work about climate change, essentially. Well, it's brilliant research. You know, yeah. that in itself will teach all of us you know what's really involved so yeah well done um i wanted to spend a bit more time on sort of creative things but i do want to kind of bring us on to the big question of system change and um inclusivity diversity but um also yeah i just had a quote that i wanted to read out to sort of set us up for this um but maybe when we have our next panel we can talk more about kind of works that have been written about the climate crisis or how to bring audiences on board with things um you know for me it's a massive area that i think about all the time but um system change frankly seems the biggest thing of all um so i was just going to read a sentence uh, this is from my wildlife trust magazine and this is uh jillian burke um, and uh, she's saying, one thing we can all agree on is that we have the fight of our lives right now in meeting the twin challenges of the climate and ecological crisis. Um, and she says, if we're ever really going to walk the walk and do things differently, we're going to need the full power of diverse voices and perspectives to forge resilience and adaptability in a fresh new system that serves everyone and everything and exploits nothing and no one. 
And um, that just really jumped out at me as I ate breakfast yesterday. Um, so I'd really like to open up this question of system change, you know, all of the challenges. Uh, and I'd love to uh, kick it over to you if I could, Cherise, just to start us off with thinking about, I mean, obviously Black Lives and Music has set out with a really specific campaign. Um, and yeah, it would just be really good to hear about your perspective on classical music uh, you know how how the classical music world is generally you know and, and then I'd like to broaden it out really to sort of thoughts on how how we make change how we make big change how do we petition you know for 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 legislation and so yeah if that's okay oh I'm not on mute sorry I'm checking if I'm on mute <laughs> um uh well uh, I guess in the introduction to Black Lives and Music and uh, Black Lives and Music, we aim to address the issues of diversity and inclusion in classical music. As you, you know, I had an interview today and they were like, why did you choose jazz and classical music? And for us, it, although it's a, a smaller sector than commercial music, the issues of diversity are visual. You know, you do not see uh, people of colour in orchestras and people might point to Chinake and um, various other groups, but that's a polarisation. Those were created because there was not a space for people of colour to play in orchestras. And we work at a grassroots level, we work in education and we work to help and support the careers of classical music, black and um, classical music um, musicians, jazz and classical music, music musicians. And I think one of the reasons why I'm, I was happy to join this conversation was because of the conversation. I think it's important for all of us to speak. And, you know, like you said earlier, um, Sarah, as if we were at, at a pub and have that conversation and take those ideas that we have and then put them into action. And that's what we'd like to do today. So one of the things that I feel strongly about in regards to climate, the climate crisis that we're in, and you know, there, there are organizations and the mayor and everybody's trying to find solutions, but the truth is it affects the disadvantaged in this country and across the world the most. You know, if you're poor, if you're indigenous, you're, you know, you're indigenous people, you're, you're black, you're a person of color, you're likely to live, not have the resources to ha live a, in a green area. You know, you're more likely to have been brought up on a council estate, you know, next to uh, the motorway. So you are likely to feel the effects of the climate crisis firsthand. And then we're seeing that with the health of our young children today. So I think it's important for us to have this conversation, to speak, to come out with solutions and then take action. And, you know, so far, I'm, 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 I might, we might have to consider coming off the cloud and, you know, <laughs> digging out a hard drive from the cupboard somewhere, you know, and, and doing our bit. But that will, those small things will equate to larger things that will, change and help our young people in society and that's what we're about in black lives and music we really want to see change we want to see those who do not have the same opportunities as others get the opportunity get an equal chance and that's what we're about here so that's why i'm happy to be a part of this conversation yeah well thank you i'm really grateful that you're here and i was i would really urge people to go and look on the black lives and music website because i i learned loads yesterday so thank you um Lau, do you want to jump in at all? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, so th this is something, of course, Sarah, we, we've talked about and, and also um, Juris on the phone as well, but I, I sort of really strongly feel that, I mean, th these last 18 months have been kind of uh, a shock to maybe the, the public awareness in many ways. Of course, COVID happened, but also um, George Floyd's murder happened um, and Sarah Everard's murder happened. And these shocks to, to the public realm are, are manifestations of, of you know hundreds of years uh, of of exploitation by the status quo of black people of people of color of of women of gender minorities of gender diverse people and, and so on and so on so and, and it feels 
it can feel sometimes that these are competing for our attention. That oh, should we should we stand behind Sarah Everard and, and reclaim the streets, or should we stand behind Me Too? Should we stand behind Black Lives Matter? We, you know, where do we? How do we navigate this as individuals and organisations? Um, and the climate crisis is underpinning. It's it's there always. It's getting worse always. It's going to affect all of us eventually. Of course, disadvantaged people will feel the impact sooner and more wor like worse, but if, then no one can escape it. Um, so, so that, that sort of like conflict internally perhaps, um, and I imagine organizationally can be that, how, how do we navigate that? How do we talk about and these campaigns? How, where do we put our weight at each given moment? Um, and and as, as we discussed there as well, and, and I think that actually all of these struggles are the same. They're all trying to change the status quo. And it is the same status quo as that quote you read in the beginning that exploits black people, that exploits and oppresses women, that exploits and oppresses the environment. And it is, all of these causes are reacting to the same root problem. And it is essentially, part of the solution has to be to overthrow that root cause of the problem. Otherwise, you're gonna be putting patchwork solutions and bandage solutions that are not really gonna get you anywhere long-term. Um, and, and this is, I think, a big question. And there's a couple of questions in the um, in the chat around using our voices and campaigning. And Julie's Bicycle as well talk about not just doing what we can as individuals and organizations, but also then using our position in the arts to um, to affect uh, change and campaign for things that we can't change, can't, can't control directly. So I think that is a, a really big one that I think would be really interesting to see a sort of more public joining of these causes as not just what we're fighting for, which is black lives, which is women's lives, which is the environment, but what are we fighting against, which is the status quo. And this is the thing that needs changing. I just and think I just, this is a, yeah, sure. Sorry, just, I'm going to just tail end on that. You know, one of the stories that we've heard just last night, which was the pulling out of the six top six football clubs out of the Super League. You know, I've got, you know, I've got my own qualms with that, but the power of your voice to come against, you know, society, to come against the greed, you know, the, 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 the lions, if you would, who own everything, you know, we can use our voice for change. And I think it's important to do so. And that's proof of it. I just wanted to say that. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> I think we all agree. Sarah, sorry. You've yeah, I, I was just musing over the uh, the, the, the sort of the, the phrase systemic change and actually a lot of some things are difficult to do and we've got to acknowledge that it doesn't mean we can't tackle them, but some things are going to take a bit longer, even though we are in a crisis and we, we, we just have to kind of acknowledge that but there are some things where we can actually reframe things quite quickly. So, um, sorry, this is going back to, to print again, but, you know, as many of you will understand, this is a big thing in the, in the music world. But actually, I think if we reframe that, the, the point of doing programmes is to deliver information. It's about sharing knowledge. The printed programme is just the delivery mechanism. It's like newspapers. They, they fell into this thing of what they sold was, was, was paper. It's not. It was information and news and analysis. Um, and I think that's why uh, when, when there was the shift to, to online, there were some papers that just didn't get their heads around that at all. And there were some that really embraced it very, very quickly and made something of it. And I think there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from, from that sort of uh, behavior. And, and one thing that, you know, that I really want to keep from, from the last 18 months that we've, we've lived through is the, the concept of remote audiences because we started it at the beginning because we had to, uh, because there was no other way of communicating and whether you were a musician that, that felt the need to, uh, to perform and interact with people or whether you were a festival trying to keep audiences and let's be honest, donors engaged. Um, you know, it was something that, that was really important to do. But actually, as we we're beginning to merge back into things, I mean, we're, fingers crossed, having a festival in, in July, we've actually created two pieces that are specifically um, meant to be viewed on screens. Um, and we're going to present that in two ways. One will be that we'll do a, a streaming at a, at a set time and 
probably 30 days afterwards for people to watch. But we're also hiring an independent cinema so that people that want to come together and watch these screen-based classical music items can do that. And I think that's really important that we don't forget the remote audiences that we've built up because there are a lot of people that can't access for myriad reasons, can't access what we do, can't get to East London. You know, whether it's whether it's a health condition or, or, or they, they live in the Outer Hebrides or whatever. And I think this kind of, uh, it's kind of moving into an intersectional approach to, to a lot of these issues. It's really, really important to think this through and, and not just to slide back to how we've always done things in the past, because there are so many silver linings that we can take from what has otherwise been a really pretty crappy 18 months. Yeah, it's been a dramatic level of change, hasn't it, for all of us? Um, I do want to come to you, Lab, but I'm also looking at the time thinking, um, you know, we've got like our 11 minutes left and um, I want to jump on some messages that Maddie's been sending me. Can you say your thing really quickly and then I'm going to try and cover, cover a couple of questions? We'll take 30 seconds. I was, and sorry, Sharice, I know you also wanted to have your hand on enough. Oh, I'll show you I... yours, but um, I was going to say that you really really interesting point and also thinking about the immediacy and access to information and an image that we have like with George Floyd's murder that footage went live on the internet within minutes and within minutes people could view it here and get angry and get on the streets within hours and that immediacy has allowed us to get together across borders and across differences in a way that was, is completely unprecedented and that is something we could definitely leverage as organizations working with mediums that speak emotionally, that, that communicates to wide range of people. And now we can actually use that and reach much, much wider audiences and maybe communicate that sense of urgency and get together as organizations in a way that hasn't been possible before. That's a great point. Cherise, sorry, did you have another? Oh, no, that was a great point. I think we should leave it there. No, <laughs> I, really quickly, just to say um, that there's another silver lining with the the whole streaming sorry i know gabriel you brought it up earlier on but with the whole streaming um events aspect which is it in revenue you know ultimately you'll have a wider audience you know if depending on how it's publicized you can go international with your festivals you know so it's it there's revenue in regards to not forgetting your audience your remote audience i just wanted to add that at the end great thank you um so um uh, maddie's been very helpfully sending questions direct to me um i think she's been sort of trying to read everything but clearly we're not going to be able to answer all the questions in the chat there's quite a lot of chat there um so i'm going to just quickly buzz down things that maddie sent to me i'm going to read like a few questions and then maybe throw it open to all of you to jump in um, and a quick point, which is that Music Declares Emergency are campaigning for a musician's rail card. How cool is that? So we don't have to feel bad that we're not 26 anymore, um, <laughs> which I'm, I'm really, really into that. Um, and also it's worth mentioning that Julie's Bicycle are doing loads about sustainability in, the, in well, the whole art industry of the arts. So if you are interested um, to, to read more about practical stuff, Julie's Bicycle is good. The chat's amazing. It's full of so mm. many brilliant links. I hope someone's saving it. Um, things people can do change to renewable energy divest their money pensions and banks away from fossil fuels there's also another campaign coming on like earth percent is it maddie is that right yeah which is about musicians giving a percentage of their income to environmental organizations uh so much lovely information here um so i'm gonna read out a couple of questions and just throw them open um, can I ask how slash if you have conversations about intergenerational justice? This is so interesting to me because I feel like the climate crisis and COVID were the opposite because the climate crisis, the old people need to look after the young and in COVID, the young had to look after the old. And I find that quite fascinating. Anyway, she says, uh, or this person says, especially within the context of cost, because ultimately younger people will shoulder debt especially in developing already overexploited world and marginalized communities. So that's question one. Question two, alongside all of the practical things discussed, surely one of the most important things we can do as an industry is to use our voice, our platform and our creativity to inspire wider change in our community. Laura's Bicycle Composition is a great example of something like that. I totally agree. Um, and I thought there was another question, but I can't see it. So, uh, yeah. I think, is that it, Maddie? Is that all of the ones? 
I think so. Right. I think you've covered most of most of the other stuff. Okay, great. Would anybody like to talk about generations, intergenerational justice? Yeah, go Laura. Um, yeah, I, I just thought it'd be interesting to mention that in the in the, the the feedback that we got to the the questions that we asked for the London Symphonietta piece, uh, this was something that came up uh, almost in every single person's statement, um, and even in the people that responded to it that were kind of not so great on their <laughs> climate change activism. Uh, we even had one person saying, well, I do care about my future children, but I also like my SUV kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but it was something that came up a lot. And also kind of globally, it was uh, the, actually one of the principal topics that came up in uh, the thing. And also we did have some submissions from children uh, into the thing. And uh, there was one from a very young girl. I think she might've been something like 11. Um, and um, it was it's it's actually such a powerful piece of text that it's something that we you know we felt as artists that maybe needs to be kind of featured separately on its own somehow in relation to peace rather than within the piece because actually it's kind of it's totally enough on its own and it's kind of it doesn't need any kind of editing it really portrays um uh, this aspect of the climate crisis and its effect on our future generations um I, and i think also in a lot of the the submissions that people mentioned you know there were many parents that were submitting and kind of a lot of them dealing with a huge amount of guilt uh, in fact, uh, in relation to this, and that you could see the difficulty and kind of the tearing inside themselves of trying to do everything that they could, but also this guilt that they felt helpless and couldn't do enough. Mm. Um, so it's certainly a conversation that's out there in general society for sure. Mm. Yeah, go Gabriel. I could link the linking the two questions actually is that thinking that you know classical music famously does have an older audience, you know, a lot. A lot of the, especially when you're talking about older repertoire as well, you know, you go to a concert, you know, there is a lot of old people there. So actually classical music does have a chance to educate the older generations who who are worried about climate change. But I, I feel from older generation I know, they, they're like, well, it's a bit inconvenient to get an electric car. I don't know how it's going to work. Or, you know, they, they, you know, older people find it hard to change their lifestyles. That's just how we are as human beings. We, we get more conservative, more set in our ways. But actually classical music that does have a big link with old people, perhaps there's a real opportunity for us to, to not be shy of actually putting the environment at the front of maybe quite standardized classical concerts, making sure there is a message there. Mm. I noticed another note, someone said in Germany, they felt that some classical artists were holding back their voice because they thought it wasn't a good image. But we've just got to get over that, you know, yeah. and it's a chance for us actually to use our voice for the older generations and encourage them to make more changes. And I mean, I don't know about the costs, how yeah. that's going to be. I would love to okay. come come in on that and try and wrap us up and do the end. But Camilla, go. You had your hand up. Sorry. OK, I'll be as quick as I can. I think um, I think that's a really interesting point, Gabriel. And actually, I was thinking about it earlier, um, how music and composers have always like since before music was notated used music to express what's going on in the world around them and express their opinions and share that with their audiences so this is not something new classical music all music has always done this it tells a story it expresses things that we struggle to express it through other means of, of art but um, I also think that there's a distinction to be drawn because the danger you run into, I think, is if you seem as if you're preaching, that can be off-putting. So for me, um, coming up with new works and commissions which, which look at the world around us and address it with humour and openness and, and warmth, which is something I think Sarah um, does brilliantly, and Laura, obviously, with this bicycle piece, it's a great thing. Um, that's that's really key and, and and understanding as well that people want to consume music for its own sake and not always with a message but equally creating space for things that do have a message and can maybe help people unlock a new understanding of things like climate change or diversity or whatever it might be political issues that we're dealing with and that, that really affect our society um, and music really has that ability to help you think about things in a completely different way and that's something so powerful that we can do as an industry. Um, and, you know, there is power when we join our voices together 
and at a local level with Cheltenham festivals we've been working with our local council the University of Gloucester so kind of local partners to also try and amplify that message and at a regional level as well as a national level kind of get people involved in those conversations so there's all sorts of ways that we can that we can start making change fantastic so joining voices together seems to be our conclusion i think um because you know that there isn't an end to this conversation this is just the beginning um i would love to uh, share my own experiences of making a piano recital about climate change but um you can look up that on the internet it's called 12 years and i might even put it on the music declares emergency on sunday because this is the quick shout out if you want to join music declares sign up at musicdeclares.net and on Sunday, it's the first ever classical day for Music Declares Emergency. So if you want to like get your piano, get your trumpet, get your whatever it is and make some noise, tag it, turn up the volume, no music on a dead planet and shove it into the social media space. Try not to feel guilty about the streaming and, um, <laughs> and you know, share your you know, own voices, own perspective. Um, we would love that for Sunday to be a general kind of the classical music shares um, shares you know everything with ourselves. So um, thank you, Maddie. Do you need to do a quick uh, ending? But I would really personally love to thank all the panelists. It's been such a pleasure to listen to you and to have you here. And thanks for responding really quickly to my emails. Um, it's great to start the classical declares yeah campaign. Here we are. Yes, thank you very much, everybody, for um, for the panellists and for all of you for selling out this um, brilliant inaugural event. Um, just a reminder that on our website, we have the Classical Declares Open Letter, which has got some pretty um, big names who put their who put, who put their weight behind it. Um, and the and that's going to be revealed on Sunday. So um, if you want to um, put your name to that letter, please do. It's on the website. I've also put it in the chat. Thank you very much for joining and sign up at www.musicdeclares.net and follow us at, at musicdeclares. Thank you and bye. Excellent. Thank you all very much.